Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today I'm going to try something a little different from my uh, normal uh, experimental uh, data-driven routine. Uh, many of my uh, colleagues uh, with whom I write that stuff are here and grateful for that. Uh, but today it's a purely theoretical project, uh, which I believe means I can just make stuff up. Is that <laughs> so, that's, that's my strategy today. Uh, we do that in you empirical have to work. Tell me how well I do. Uh, so, uh, what I'm interested in is uh, trying to conceive of a theory of copyrightable authorship and writings. Right? What is it that uh, constitutes the nature of the relationship between some person we call an author and some thing we call a writing? Right? So here's the clause. Uh, there has been surprisingly little uh, academic or judicial inquiry into what these two terms might mean. Um, you know, compared to other aspects of copyright law, compared to other aspects of the Constitution, right? I mean, we know less about maybe what the Third Amendment means than we do about these things, but we don't know an awful lot about these two very central terms of copyright jurisprudence. So what do we know? We know a bit from, from the courts and from scholars. Author seems to imply some sort of originality, which I take to mean kind of independent creation or non-copying, and it suggests a degree of minimal creativity, right? This is price. Writing means that it's fixed in some tangible medium, that these are imposed by the constitutional language. Uh, but of course, lots and lots of things could be original, minimally creative, and fixed in a tangible medium. Uh, break pads, ashtrays, priceless directories. If you remember the, the dissent in Maserick, the Justice Douglas, we've never confronted these issues uh, squarely. We don't know whether any of these things really are writings. Uh, and since then, we still haven't, right? The court has never decided to take a case uh, in which it confronts squarely the boundaries of these questions, right? Um, so these are the two questions I want to try and answer today. Uh, one is, what is the scope of Congress's power under Article I, Section 8, Clause 8? How much strength, uh, what can they do given the power, assuming that this power imposes some boundaries, some limitations on their abilities? Uh, and second, what aspects of copyright awards in fact qualify for copyright protection? The questions I'm not going to attempt to answer today, but which I think this theory could attempt to answer, uh, are questions associated with things like uh, Garcia, um, questions associated with uh, 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 works made for hire and the constitutionality of those provisions. Uh, I'm not going to discuss them uh, useful articles. Uh, so this is the kind of general scope of the questions that I'm interested in. Right? So the first thing is, so if you think about the way uh, the Constitution and the 1976 Act, for example, work, it looks something like this schematically. The Constitution provides an outer bound on congressional power, uh, which is the blue, you know, the big white circle, right? Everything else in this kind of shaded blue area, right, is not an author's writing, and thus is not subject to copyright protection. Within that white circle, however, Congress chooses to provide copyright protection to certain what we're now calling original works of authors. Right? So those are the things within the red circle. So the two questions I'm going to try and answer are, how big is this white circle, and what's inside and what's outside? And given that something is within the red circle, what aspects of that thing are copyrightable? Right? Because presumably only the aspects of that thing that are authorship are copyrightable. Right? Copyright wouldn't apply to anything that wasn't an aspect of authorship. So what is it that authors do? We've got various I, we could call them theories. I don't know that always uh, they always have worked out enough to be considered a kind of coherent uh, theory of what authors do. Sometimes we're told they express ideas, um, but ideas become very difficult to conceive of both practically and theoretically. I'm going to return to some of the challenges with that later. Uh, this approach has been an enormous failure. See Mannion. Uh, there's also been all kinds of difficulties with the application of whatever Section 102B is supposed to be doing. And best courts have gotten to some notion of maybe what authors do is something like exercise unconstrained choice, but we're never really told what those choices are about, why they make them. We never inquire, it seems. Here's my theory. Right? My theory is that what authors do, right, authorship entails the intentional production of mental effects in an audience, the desire to produce some set of mental effects in an audience. Thus, a writing is anything capable of producing those mental effects. Copyright can attach to any of the original, creative, and fixed 
manner or form in which the author produces those pendulum effects. So that's a lot of stuff, and now I'm going to break it all down and explain what I, I'm trying to explain what I think I mean by all of those things. So let's start with intentions. What do I mean by intentions? I'm borrowing a, a language here from a, 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 a philosopher of aesthetics named Gerald Levinson, who distinguishes between two sets of intentions. On the one hand, an uh, author might have semantic intentions, intentions about what the work should mean or means to her. Right? Separately from that, authors have categorical intentions, intentions about how the work should be taken. Right? So an author might write a poem and have ideas about the meaning of that poem, that it's a satire or not. Right? That's a semantic intention. Separately, though, the author has a categorical intention that the thing she has written is a poem and not a laundry list, and not a painting, and not any other thing, not computer software. It's a categorical intention about what kind of thing it is that she has created. The former are all kinds of problematic in lots of ways that critical theorists will tell us all about. The good news is I don't care about them. At least I don't care about them for the purposes of the threshold inquiry of copyrightability. They're going to come back in all kinds of ugly ways for substantial similarity and fair use. I'm not writing that paper, so I don't have to answer those questions now. <laughs> this is a threshold question. So what do we do with categorical intentions, right? The question we ask is simple. Did the author intend to create some aspects of the thing, right? Did she intend that some aspects of the thing would create mental effects in an audience? What aspects of the thing did she intend would create mental effects in the audience? Those are the kinds of things that constitute her authorial relationship with the thing that she has produced. That's what she has done. Right? If yes, right, if there's some aspects of the thing that she's created, the answer is yes, she did intend that they create mental effects in an audience, right? then those things are authorship for our purposes and are protectable if right, all of these other things, right? Protectable, original, creative, fix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay, so all of those things. So what then do I mean by mental effects? The question I'm trying to ask is, what do paintings and novels and photographs and musical compositions and all of these things that we think of as copyrightable authorship have in common? My argument is that the best way to conceive of what they do is they create mental effects. So what I'm distinguishing between here is between things that influence the mind or the brain. We can get really complicated about that. I really don't want to, but tell me if you think I need to, right? Um, and the rest of the world. So in a way, I'm embracing a kind of Cartesian duality between stuff in the head and everything else in the world. But the reason I like this language is because then I want to use it to kind of break down a separate Cartesian duality between rationality and emotion, right? So I think there's an awful lot of stuff that copyrightable authorship does, which doesn't fall neatly within the category of expressing ideas. Right? Expressing ideas has all kinds of co commitments to rationalism, notions that what works do is have some, some semantic content. And I just don't see, I don't believe that the kinds of things that matter for copyrightable works necessarily involve semantic content. They may often, but they don't always. And thus, I think we need a broader conception of what it is that works do. I don't like saying this mental effects language. It's not pretty to me. <laughs> if you've got a better term, please tell me, because it's, it's not great. But I do like it better than trying to figure out what's an idea and what's an expression and how is something expressed right, in lots of different works. Um, the point, then, is that the manner or form is the thing to which copyright attaches. Right? It's not the mental effect itself. It's the ways in which the author has collected, arranged, uh, combined various things in the world, various formal elements, line, meter, notes, smells, sounds, we can talk about those, right? uh, you know, in such a way as to create a mental effect. Right? We isolate the selections that she's made in order to do this, right? the formal choices that she's made about the, the work. Right? Those are the things that constitute the authorial relationship with the writing, right? And it's this manner of form that's important. That's the thing to which we apply these questions of originality, creativity, and fixation. And at this point, you'll start to notice, right, one or two B kind of drops out, 
right? This is one of the things I really like about what I think I can do here, is that we don't have to worry about these really complicated terms like what's a process and what's a method and why one thing's a process and one thing's a taxonomy and why this is a method and dance is one thing. And like, right? So these are really hard questions that courts are struggling with constantly. District courts are constantly reversed, different circuits split, the same circuit makes the different judgments about everything. But right? this is a really difficult inquiry, which I think I've significantly simplified. So let me talk about the two ways in which I want to apply it to uh, current doctrine. The first one is this question of constitutional scope. The scope of the constitutional language in Article 1, Section 8, it provides protection for writings of authors. The way that I'm conceiving what a writing of an author is, is significantly broader than we've previously understood in many cases, right? So by contemplating mental effects rather than merely expressing ideas, I think this opens us up to the possibility that writings might entail uh, important other creative media, including things like gardens, cuisine, tactile media, yoga, various ways in which authors create experiences for others that they expect to have some kind of mental influence on them to make them feel good, to improve, or to, to, to give them some sense of you know, emotion, to remind them of some memory, right? all of the weird things that authors might do in any kind of way. Right? This understands all of those things as potential aspects of authorship. Importantly, right, I want everyone to read this at the bottom very carefully, right? That doesn't mean that those things have to be protected, right? So think about it this way, back to the schematic, right? This is kind of the world before my paper, right? I think, right, so we, we thought about the scope of protection this way. There are lots of these things on the outside looking in that if these things, yoga, cuisine, gardens, tactile works, all the rest, were protectable, they were protectable only via the patent system or something else like that, right? What my analysis does is it brings them within the big white circle, but still potentially leaves them outside of the red circle, right? I think these are the kinds of things that could constitute authorship. These are not the sorts of things where I think we need contemporary intellectual or copyright protection in the way it exists now, like the author plus a bajillion years and all of those things. <laughs> right? But like, stuff could change. Right? And the nice thing about the, the, you know, the, the feature rather than bug of the breadth of my theory, I think, is that it allows us to have opportunities to answer these questions as they arise. Right? So if 3D printing of food becomes a possibility in a way that we're worried it's going to drive out of the market, all of the Thomas Kellers of the world, the Guy Fieris, then we could figure out a way to deal with that. Right? If we have decided ex ante that those things aren't authorship, then we don't have an opportunity to do it, at least within the copyright clause. So this at least brings them within the world of copyright <coughs> jurisprudence, but still says, you know, not quite yet. Right? We don't need you now, right? We'll let you know if we do. Right? But they're still inside the world of protecting. <coughs> <laughs> right? In addition, right, the other thing I want my theory to do is to start to help us understand what aspects of any given work within the red circle are copyrightable. Right? Only those aspects of a given thing that are the writing of an author, that constitute authorship, count as protectable copyrightable work. Everything else has to be filtered out. Right? To the extent that something isn't copyrightable authorship, to the extent that it doesn't entail the creation of mental effects in an audience, it's not authorship and thus doesn't count in my theory. Right? It's got to be filtered out as a matter of what is potentially ownable, protectable, controllable by the copyright author. Right? And so in order to think about how to do this, you can imagine a kind of two-step test. First, find the aspects of the work that were intended to create mental effects in an audience. Right? Those are the things that potentially constitute authorship. Right? Those and no other choices made for the purposes of efficiency, for purposes of convenience, for purposes of interoperability. These are decisions, these are choices that have nothing to do with creating mental effects in an audience and thus are excluded from copyrightability. Having isolated those things, and I'm not saying that's going to be easy, right? I'm not saying that's actually necessarily an easy thing to do. All I want to do is beat the other theories, right? So, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm always right, this is going to be simple and it's a walk in the park every time for litigation. I just want it to be less of a miserable walk than the other ones, right? Having isolated those things then, the next question is, 
all the rest of the stuff. Are they fixed? Are they original, not copied? And are they at least minimally creative? If the answer to all of those things is yes, then that's copyrightable expression. Feel free, we can add the merger doctrine here too. Right? We can add in other things. We can think about how the useful articles uh, of rules would apply. Right? But at least that would get us a threshold inquiry for what is potentially copyrightable about the work. Right. So, and, and uh, as I said, right, we never have to do this kind of weird negative element stuff of 102B, right? We don't have to put a bunch of stuff in and then pull it all out, right? We only start with the stuff that was in fact copy or potentially authorship in the first place, and then we start you know, making sure that those things are original and creative and fixed and all of the rest of those sorts of things. So you can imagine how this works in various ways. Yeah, I don't have an awful lot of time, but I think you know, this helps us think better. Uh, at least about concerns about you know, various sorts of visual art uh, in which it becomes difficult to, to distinguish, say, what's the idea from the expression, right? And the difficulties that Kaplan had with respect to Mannion, uh, you know, the notion that these work, right, that there could be copyright in the creation of the scene. You know, this doesn't make sense to me, right? Instead, what we think is what aspects of the selection, arrangement, and coordination of stuff in the world Right? What formal elements did the photographer use in order to create some mental effect rather than any other thing that he's not doing? Right? Which ones of those were original to the author? Which ones of those are at least minimally creative? And which ones of those are going to their own things? Right? So that part's easy. Right? The same sorts of things with taxonomies, databases, product lists. Is there some aspect of the way in which, right? remember, it's the manner or form in which the author does something that counts. Is there some way in which the manner or form in which these things were arranged that the author intended us to experience something about them? Again, we don't necessarily need to care precisely what that thing was, right? As long as it was something mental, not non-mental. But we don't need to know precisely, like, did it intend to make us happy or sad, but what it is said is, did it intend to make us feel or think or have an idea or whatever, right? And the same sorts of things with software. When we think about the ways in which software works, we're able to do exactly the same thing. When we think about what the programmers did in designing this code, right, and putting together various things in certain sorts of ways, why did they do them? Did they do them for the purposes of improving efficiency of the program for purposes of interoperability, those are not authorship reasons. Right? Authorship reasons only entail the production of mental effects in audience. So that's what I've got. Uh, happy to hear what you all think about everything. So I, I would have really liked your paper in my first year of law school before Apple versus Franklin. Okay. Um, but you're going to have to do something with operating systems and my personal diary locked in a drawer and all kinds of other things that don't yeah. induce mental effects of work. No, no, so, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with diaries locked in a drawer, right? I mean, I, like, I, mean, I think I can deal with this. I mean, what I need to do is just attend, yeah, add on to that sentence if they were perceived. Right, so you know, great. I mean, so so you know, I'll add to the end of that sentence. Like it's a not pretty sentence already. So I don't like you know. So consider that a footnote to that sentence if they were perceived. Right, so so you know, all of these things. And you know, this boss. Right. It, so yeah. Look, Frustration. Go in. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's intended. We, we can ask these kinds of questions, right? Like, I can't necessarily ask these kinds of questions without a record in front of me of what anyone might have done, right? I can tell you how you could ask those questions if you had a bunch of people who were involved in the creation of the software and had some ideas about it, right? I don't know those ideas. I don't have those ideas. I think I could tell you how you'd ask those questions. Uh, following up on that, because I, I don't, I, I don't think that's a satisfactory answer to Dan's point on no, the software. Right? <laughs> the, point, the point of the code is not to induce a mental state in anyone. The point of the code is to generate an action by the computer. Right. So that doesn't mean, I think, that under your theory you can't get copyright for software. But what it means is that the copyright for software that you would have is the flip side, it's the exact opposite of the way we currently do it. You would not protect code, you would not protect low level protection, at most you'd protect the kind of high level gestalt um, uh, thing that we've actually backed away from 20 years ago. Look, I don't know that I would protect anything in code. I would probably protect basically zero, right? I mean, like, you know, so the, you know, here's the trouble, I don't read code, I'm not a computer programmer, right? You know, so my guess, if I understood code well enough to understand what's going on, there's almost zero in the code that is protectable copyright, right? At least to the extent that the goal of the code, the thing that the code is intended to do is to produce an otherwise non-copyrightable thing, 
Right, so if the code is producing a visual display, then it's just a copy of that visual display. Those are the easy problems. We don't have an issue with those. Right? With what the code is intended to do is to produce non-copyrightable effects, right? only the aspects of that code that are doing something like authorship are copyrightable. And my guess is that's really nothing. Right? It's almost always pretty close to nothing. Yeah, Rebecca. Uh, I don't care about code. Uh, Good, thank you. Your, your standard reminds me of this line from Chicago. I guess you can say we broke up because of artistic differences. He saw himself as alive, I saw him dead. Uh, maybe seven, which is to say uh, that lots of acts are intended to create effects in the audience. Racially motivated killings are intended to create effects in the audience. This seems to be, your standard seems to me to be a reframing or importation of the speech conduct distinction from First Amendment law. And there, I gotta say, it tends not to solve the problem it's offered to solve. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, uh, consider Duchamp's toilet, right? Mm -hmm. So, fixed, intended to create mental mm -hmm. effects. What does your theory offer to that inquiry that we don't have? Uh, so look, I'm not sure that it's going to make differences in at least some of the easy questions where we can answer, you know, where, where idea expression kind of does okay, right? Like idea expression is. Is Duchamp an easy case? I think Duchamp's already. Yeah, Duchamp is clearly a work of authorship, right? I mean, like, really? so to me, the thing that Duchamp is doing. The, the thing that I don't think, so, so the questions I'm not sure about are the ones that I'm not asking, which is what does originality mean, and what does creativity mean, and what does fixed mean? These are not the questions I'm asking, right? So we could go back and we could ask all of those questions according to whatever your theories of originality, creativity, and fixation are. I don't have a theory of any of those, right? At least not in this paper I don't, right? Instead, what I have a theory of is what is the nature of the behavior that the author did that potentially constitutes authorship? Right? What he did there right, was he got something and he presented it in such a way for certain sets of reasons. Right? And those reasons, I think, are pretty unambiguously to create some set of mental effects in an audience. Right? He clears the hurdle for copyrightable authorship at the level of the inquiry that I care about. Right? We then have to go in and ask harder questions about originality and creativity and all the rest of that. That's just not my inquiry at this point. Right? And I think you need my inquiry to, ins to, ins to isolate a bunch of other stuff that was otherwise getting in. Right? I just don't think that's a hard case at the level of the question that I'm asking. Yeah? Added, yeah uh, we're out of time. Oh, sorry. We'll talk later. Thank you very much. Oh. This was really